Welcome to Life Church. We're so glad you've chosen to join us online for another life changing message. We would love to have you experience God's presence with us in person at one of our exciting services at 3688 Highway 109 North in Lebanon, Tennessee. If you're watching on social media, be sure to like, follow, share, and subscribe. On our website, lifechurchfamily.com, you can learn more about us, get directions and service times, watch many of our previous sermons, or make a donation to help us continue to share God's Word in our region and around the world. Again, just go to lifechurchfamily.com. Here's the message. We are kicking off a sermon series that I am so excited about called How to Love Your Marriage. Not just how to love the thought of marriage or the idea of marriage, but how to actually love the marriage that you are in. Now, before some of you single people make up your mind, okay, I'm going to check out the next few weeks because this doesn't apply to me. I want to remind you that Jesus said that marriage between a husband and a wife was a picture, an illustration of Christ and the church. So anytime you study marriage, you're going to learn about the church. You're going to learn about Christ. And you're going to learn things that will help you, I promise. All the relational advice you're going to get in this sermon will help you with your other family relationships, with relationships on the job, help you not to hate your neighbor so much. We're going to help you to have a better life, but I'm so excited that we're going to help people have great marriages. 2020, we've been praying. You know, we had an entire week of fasting and prayer. The theme of that week was praying for this to be a year of greatness. One of the areas that I really believe God wants to make great at Life Church is marriages. I believe He doesn't want you to endure your marriage. He wants you to enjoy your marriage, to love your marriage. And I even had people come to me last year saying, Pastor, I know you teach about marriage uh, frequently on Wednesday nights, but could you do a series on Sundays? And I've kind of held off on doing a lot of Sunday series simply for those that might be single or those that might be divorced, uh, the widower, uh, the widow, and it might feel uncomfortable, but I just really felt like the Lord said, do this sermon series on Sunday. People need it. And again, you're going to learn about more than just marriage. You're going to learn about how to have a right relationship with God, how to have a, a good life. Everybody say, I'm going to have a good life. All right, so we're going to roll into this sermon series called How to Love Your Marriage. Let me start off with a few one-liners that I found, slightly humorous. One person said, marriage is a relationship in which one person is always right. And the other is a husband. I think a woman wrote that. I'm pretty sure. Uh, second one, my wife and I always compromise. I admit I'm wrong and she agrees with me. Again, probably written by a woman. A daughter said to her mom, Mom, what's marriage? The mom replied, Marriage is just a fancy word for a woman adopting an overgrown male who can't be handled by his parents anymore. <laughs> One guy says to his buddy, he says proudly, my wife's an angel. His buddy goes, wow, you're lucky. Mine's still alive. No, <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible. That's just wrong. I think, I think seriously, I'm not making this up. Somebody in our church, I saw this one on Facebook, has T-shirts with this on it. So you can probably buy this T-shirt uh, for your husband. It says, I don't always agree with my wife, but when I do, things usually go better. <laughs> No, dear, I do not want you to buy that for Valentine's Day for me. No. A husband was irate and he said to his wife, I was a fool when I married you. And the wife responded, I know, sweetie, but I was in love and I didn't notice. <laughs> One more. Marriages are made in heaven, but then again, so is thunder and lightning. So, All right. I, I have been blessed. I just got to start off by saying I've been blessed to be married to my lovely bride going on 34 years and so on. That doesn't make me an expert necessarily, but I, I said it on Facebook today. It does put me in the endangered species category because there's not a lot of people that stay married very long. I mean, I mean, we, we're, we're in, a, in a time where there's a lot of divorce going on. Matter of fact, January has been nicknamed Divorce Month. Did you know that? There are more divorces filed for in January than any other time of the year. Matter of fact, uh, Pinterest queries for divorce party rose 21% in January. 
I'm not sure why you want to throw a party and celebrate the destruction of a marriage, but apparently a lot of people do. Google searches for divorce peak during the first two weeks of January every year. Then you, then you factor in this. It says 50% 50 of all marriages in the U.S. end in divorce. 50%. I remember when it was one out of four and we thought it was bad. And then it became one out of three. And we said, oh my, now they're saying one out of every two marriages in America end in divorce. And the thing is, for second marriages, third marriages, fourth marriages, the percentages go up. They get higher. So that tells me we've got to get back to the Word of God and we've got to find out how to have a great marriage. Amen? USA Today published uh, an article, which I was honestly surprised they published because we all know the USA Today is neither Christian nor conservative. So it's surprising, but they published an article and they said, many people are buying this myth, this argument that says, divorce will make me happy. And if I'm happy, my children will be happy. And the article went on to say that is a completely false statement. That, that by and large, divorced people are not happier, they're unhappier. Uh, that their children are not happier. Their children are less happy. Matter of fact, they even found that divorced people have higher suicide rates than those who do not divorce. So again, I think we've got to figure out how to love our marriages. Listen, for those of you that think, well, you know, my, my marriage, if I end it, if I get divorced, my children will be better off because they won't be around the fighting and the fussing. And listen to the, listen to the effects that divorce has on children. First of all, the physical effects. Dr. Lawrence Berger wrote a book about research that shows children whose parents have divorced are more likely to experience injury, asthma, headaches, and speech impediments. Following divorce, children are 50% more likely to develop health problems. Wow. Listen to the emotional effects. Dr. Berger also listed studies that showed children from divorced homes they have more psychological problems than children who lose a parent to death. I was blown away. I mean, I can't imagine anything more traumatic on a child than losing a parent to death. But they say children who go through divorce experience more traumatic emotional injury than the other. Long-term effects. Adult children of divorce tend to have lower paying jobs and less college education. And they have a greater vulnerability to drugs and alcohol. One more, the educational effects. Children of divorced parents are twice as likely to drop out of high school than those of parents who choose to stick it out and stay together. Everybody say stay together. Amen. The reason the divorce rate keeps rising, the reason the divorce rates keep rising and marriages keep falling apart, I'm going to tell you, it's because marriages by and large are built on a contract and a commitment rather than being built on covenant, which is how God created marriage. Covenant is the foundation of forever. And if you don't get covenant, then there's a good possibility you're going to struggle to keep your marriage going. Marriages are not merely commitments. There are many, many committed people who go before a judge or go before a preacher or go before a Star Trek fan who wrote in and got the Star Trek ordination license so they can marry somebody, they go in, they're very committed. They, they say, I do. Until death, do as part, I do. But then they don't. Because commitment is not enough. Hello? Don't get quiet on me now. A contract with the county clerk's office is not enough to keep your marriage together. Because God said, I'm not creating a contract. You see, a contract is, is focused on the issues the contract covers. Let's say Bob and I, Bob and I decide we're going to go into business together. I'm going to join his guitar business. If you've never seen a Bob Zide cleft guitar, cleft guitars are amazing, and he builds those. Well, I decide I'm going to enter into a contract with Bob to go into business with him. Well, that's going to be fine and good because, you know, we're going to make a lot of money. It's going to be wonderful. However, the minute we start losing money, or Bob and I have an argument and we don't agree anymore, we don't have the same philosophy, we don't have the same views, all of a sudden we're going to decide, you know what, this contract's over with. We're going to end that contract. Somebody's going to break it. We're going to go our separate ways because we're not in a covenant, we're in a contract. Let's listen to this. A covenant is relational, not just contractual. Okay, Dr. Scott Hand said this. He said a contract is an exchange of promises. That's what people often do when they get married. They exchange promises. But he says a covenant is an exchange of persons. Oh, everybody say covenant 
is the foundation of forever. Matter of, you know, if you think about it, anybody who, who gets married, forever is somewhere, in, at least in the back of their mind, because you say things like, till death do us part. I mean, otherwise, you just date forever, or you would just live together forever. But for some reason, people decide, I want to get married. And I, it's because there is a desire within us to find that person, and it lasts forever. Matter of fact, there are tons of songs about forever. Play, the, play that first song there, Forever. Forever and ever. Who knows the song? Okay. Well, now, wait a minute. Maybe that song's not your style. Maybe you're a country music fan. There are forever songs in country music. I got, I got one for you. Ever and ever. Okay, maybe you're, maybe you're more of a fan of 80s pop music. Play me some 80s pop music about forever. Yeah. Okay, that's good enough. You can cut that off. Admit it, you want your marriage to last, for, well, forever on this earth anyway, until death do us part, right? Covenant is the foundation of forever. See, a contract creates partners, but covenant creates kinship. Can I say that one more time? A contract creates partners, but a covenant creates kinship. That's why when a husband and a wife come together, it starts out Mrs. Jones and Mr. Smith, but when they leave, it's Mr. and Mrs. Smith, why, why does the woman let go of her maiden name? It's because it's symbolic of the fact that we're no longer two individuals. We're now one together. And therefore, we share the same name because God has made us one. We're now kin. Everybody's saying, I'm related. Covenant comes from, uh, we see it in the Old Testament. The, the marriage covenant originally started in the very beginning of the Old Testament, God enters into a covenant with a man named Abraham. And just to give you a little information about covenants, and the reason, the reason that God enters into a covenant with Abraham is because Abraham asks a question. He says, how can I know you're going to keep your promises? And really, isn't that what you want to know when you get married? How do I know you're going to keep your promises? I mean, you're saying all this stuff uh, there when we're getting married. You're saying that before the preacher. But how do I know you're going to keep your promises? Well, you know, God tells Abraham, I'm going to do all these great things and huge things. And so Abraham's like, Lord, how can I know you're really going to do this? So Abraham, knowing that a God, knowing that Abraham was familiar with a covenant because covenants existed before God entered into a covenant with Abraham, people on the earth made covenants. So God says, I'm going to use something Abraham can understand. I'm going to enter into a covenant with you. And so he has Abraham go and get the animals and split them in half because in a covenant ceremony, you would take an animal, be it a cow or whatever animal it might be, you would split that animal in half, separate the sides just a little bit, and then the two people entering into covenant together would both walk through the blood in the middle. Now, the idea of a covenant was that once we walk through this blood together, we're now blood brothers. We're now kin. We're related. And if I, if I do not honor our agreement, then you, then you can kill me. My life has to go because we're one now, and I cannot just abandon you. I can't, I can't go against this covenant. A covenant was, was, was built on your life. And so God has, has Abraham lay out all these animals and then God in the form of a flame of fire goes between the animals and says I'm entering into covenant with you and that's why even though every nation on the earth has tried to annihilate Israel they have not been able to do it because God's in covenant with them amen I mean, I'm sorry. Pakistan may not like them. Iran may not like them. Uh, half the people in the United States may not like Israel. Get over it. God's made a covenant with them, and he's sticking with it. And then, and then God said, you know what? Not only do I want to be in a covenant with Israel, I want to be in a covenant with anyone who will come to me. So Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood so that we could enter into a, a blood covenant with God because our sins had separated us from God. So through the blood of Jesus and that blood covenant, we get to be one with God again, and we get to be kin with Him. He, he adopts us, and we become His children. Praise God. Well, covenant is awesome. And so when God gets over to Malachi, well, and He starts talking about marriage, He says, guys, you didn't just sign a contract. You entered into a covenant. I made you kin. That's powerful. Praise God. As a matter of fact, uh, did you know even consummating the marriage was designed by God in His intelligent uh, design. It was designed to 
cause you to enter into a blood covenant? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 16 says, For do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. Now, if you, if you marry a virgin, uh, most of you know this, a woman who's never had intercourse, at least most of the time, when she has intercourse for the first time, there is a small tear that takes place. And what gets, uh, what gets uh, released? Blood, right? Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, you go back and you read, if a man married a woman and then after the wedding night did not see blood uh, as, as a result of that, he could then say, hey, I want this marriage annulled, and he would be released from the marriage because they would assume that she had been unfaithful. So God says, you know what? I'm even going to create the human body so that when a man and a woman come together, they become one, and there's a blood covenant there. Hallelujah. Matter of fact, it says there, even if you unite with a prostitute, it says you become one. Interesting, I heard uh, a woman on one of James Dobson's radio programs years ago. She was a doctor, and she had done all these studies, and she said when a woman has sexual relations, there's a chemical that is produced in her brain that immediately makes her feel connected to the person uh, emotionally connected, re almost relationally connected to the person that she just slept with. And that woman said, that's why it's so wrong for a woman to have a, a, an open sex life and go, you know, one partner after another. Because if you have 10 sex partners and then you move on, that's like going through 10 divorces. It, it's that destructive to the mind. I mean, that's the, and God created us that way because he said, when you come together, you're entering into a covenant, not just a contract. So everybody say, my marriage is a covenant. Your marriage is a covenant. Ephesians 5.31. And 32 says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united as one. Two become, when you get married, you're not just signing a little piece of paper at the clerk's office and saying we're legally now together until a judge decides we're no longer legally together. God says, I'm making you one. Praise God. We enter the body of Christ through a blood covenant, and we enter marriage through a blood covenant. Now, why is marriage important? I mean, after all, if, if you're committed to somebody and you love them, why not just date them forever? Why not? You know, why, why bother with the ring? Why bother with the ceremony? Why bother with entering into this, this covenant relationship? It's because covenant is more powerful and has a greater impact on you than a commitment does. I'm going to say it again. There are many, many committed people going through divorce right now. They made commitments. They signed a contract, but they did not make it. Listen, you need more than commitment. You need commitment. That's important. I'm not downplaying the need for commitment, but commitment alone is not going to keep your marriage together. You need to understand you're in a covenant with your spouse and with God. Let's look at that covenant between Abraham and God. Go to Genesis 15. I'm sorry, I was about to sneeze, or at least I thought I was. Don't you hate that? He's like, <laughs> and then it never happens. He's like, well, gee whiz, I just look weird for no reason. And then a moment later, I'm going to all of a sudden sneeze unexpectedly and snot's going to go everywhere. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. I do believe in covering the mouth when you sneeze. You know. Genesis 15, verse 8. Oh, how I digress and get way off track. So, Pastor, we were really spiritual a moment ago. We were talking about we were talking about covenant, blood covenants, and now you're talking about snot. That is not good. Genesis 15, verse 8. It says, But Abraham replied, remember, God had made big promises to Abraham. And again, people make big promises on their wedding day. Abraham replied, Oh sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I will actually possess it? The Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abraham presented all these to him and killed them. He cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. Fast forward to verse 17. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant. The Lord made a covenant with Abram that day. God said, I'm going to walk between the halves. I'm going to make sure that this covenant is intact. Now that's interesting because now go to Malachi chapter 2. God does the same thing when you and I enter into marriage. He does the same thing. Malachi chapter 2, look at verse 13. 
uh, they were asking the question, God, why don't you listen to our prayers anymore? Why don't you give us the things we asked for? And God responds, you weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? Is it because the Lord, it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Let me repeat that. The Lord is the witness Listen, I know you have to have a witness when you get married. Somebody, I have to sign it if I'm marrying you, and then there has to be a witness. It's usually my wife. But God says, that's not the witness that matters. Having Christy Calhoun's name on some document at the Wilson County Clerk's Office is not what matters. What matters is I witnessed your marriage, okay? Now look, he says, the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage Covenant. Marriage is a covenant. Oh my goodness. Then look what it says. Uh, it, it says, you, you have, you've been unfaithful with the marriage covenant. Now I see when God, when you get married, I need, can I get two, I need two volunteers, a married couple. Bob and Peggy, you guys come up here. You guys are going to be my, my example. Just, you know, you can just stand right here in the front. I need, I need, I tell you, you're wearing a Titans jersey, so we'll, we'll make you step up here. You're going to be God in this situation. Because we all know God would be a Titans fan, right? God would clearly be a Titans fan. And you guys, you guys face each other like it's on your wedding day. Leave a little bit of room here. God's not that skinny. He's got to get between you. I mean, he's, he's, not, not, he's not overweight or anything. I'm just saying, he's not this wide. I'm pleasantly plump. You're pleasantly plump. When they came together and, and, and she looked at him and he looked at her and said, I do, God said, I witnessed this, and God walked between that marriage, just like he walked between the two halves with Abraham. And God said, I have sealed this marriage. You're not together because a judge said you're together. You're not together because a preacher said you're together. You're together because I witnessed it, and I sent the fire of my Holy Spirit between the two of you, and I took you from being two to being one. <laughs> Praise God. You guys, thank you guys. Thank you so much. You are not just in a committed relationship. You're in a covenant relationship if you are married. Praise God. You are forever connected. Everybody say forever connected. Now that's something we have a hard time with is the idea of being forever connected. See, when God sends His fire between the two of you and makes you one, that's not something a judge can undo. See, people want to go before God and be made one, and then when they get tired of the one they're one with, they want to go before a judge and be made two again. That's not how it works. God says, I made you one, period. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Jesus actually says this four different times in the gospel. Four different times. He says, I, and I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. In other words, unless something's happened to break the covenant, and that's either adultery, Jesus said, or in 1 Corinthians 7, it lists your spouse abandoning you as someone breaking covenant with you. Unless you've been cheated on or abandoned, God says you are forever connected. And he says, so even though you go before a judge and you get that judge to say there are irreconcilable differences, if it's not adultery and not abandonment, for you to go and find somebody else, the secretary at work or whoever, God says that is adultery. Now the world said, no, 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 we were divorced before anything happened. doesn't matter. God says it's adultery. Now let me, let me give you some good news. For those of you that might have had a divorce in your past that wasn't biblical, aren't you glad that we can come before our God, we can repent of our sins, and He says He puts our sins as far away from us as east is from west. He said He remembers them no more. He said He makes all things new. If you're here this morning, don't, don't decide, you know what? I'm on my third wife. i got to leave you and go try to get the first one back. That's not what you're going to do. Again, we're blessed to be in a blood covenant with Jesus, a blood that can cleanse us from all of our sins and our mistakes. Praise God. You give that to God, and then you move on, and you make this marriage covenant the best marriage covenant it can be, all right? You make up your mind, I'm going to honor this covenant. Praise God. God says, I walk between the halves of your marriage, and I make you one. You see, when, on your wedding day, you were thinking about romance and maybe the honeymoon, but God was thinking about covenant. You were thinking about all these feelings you were having. I can't believe I have them. Oh, I get to spend the rest of my life with them. And God's saying, you're going to spend the rest of your life with them because I'm fixing to establish a covenant. 
This is covenant. This is not just feelings. You see, people oftentimes decide, I'm going to get out of the marriage because they don't feel in love anymore. God says, covenant trumps feelings. Covenant trumps whatever your spouse may have done that you don't like. Again, God gives a couple of, of occasions where He's sure. You, you know, you realize if they've broken covenant with you, if they've cheated on you, if they've, you know, abandoned you, then the Bible says you're free and you can go on. But other than that, God says you are together forever. Everybody say forever. forever. Look at your spouse and go, I'm glad I get my forever with you. Let me give you the effects of covenant breaking. The effects of covenant breaking. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land the plane here before long. But first, I got, I got to fly a little longer in this sermon. The effects of covenant breaking. Number one, breaking covenant is cruelty. Go back to Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. God said, for I hate divorce. Now let me stop right there. God did not say I hate divorced people. Well, the church was, was wrong for many years to, to act like God somehow hated divorced people and divorced people had no place in the church. That's a lie from the devil. God does not hate divorced people. He hates the act of divorce. Why does he hate it? He answers that question in the next sentence. He says, to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty. You shouldn't break covenant. You shouldn't cheat on your spouse. You shouldn't leave your spouse. You shouldn't divorce your spouse because divorce is cruel. I already read you all of the effects it has on children. It also has those same kind of effects on adults as well. So you need to not, don't, everybody say don't be mean. Don't be mean. Uh, breaking covenant is cruelty. Number two, breaking covenant kills. It kills. Remember, when someone entered into a blood covenant in, under the Old Testament, you said, hey, if I break this covenant, you can take my life. So breaking covenant was basically like committing suicide. It was basically ending your life or ending someone else's life. It kills things. Well, Jeremiah, God said this in Jeremiah 34, verse 18. He says, those who have violated my covenant. Now we're not just talking about marriage. We're talking about those who violate the covenant of God, the, the commands of God. He says, and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me. I will treat like the calf they cut in two, then walked between his pieces. God's saying, listen, if you choose to ignore the great salvation I've provided you through Jesus Christ, there will be a price to pay. And it's the second death, Revelation says. The, see, bear in mind, Death is not the body ceasing to function. That's, that's, a, that's a misunderstanding. Death is separation. For you to be completely dead means you've separated from this life and you no longer can be on this earth. You're no longer a part of this earth. Uh, many times somebody will, will, will die and stay dead for a length of time, be it minutes or hours. In some cases, people have, you know, it's been 24 hours, 48 hours, and then all of a sudden they come back to life and they say, I remember everything. I remember the exact words the doctors use when they pronounce me dead. I remember what my husband or my wife or my kids said to me while I was laying there. I remember all of it. It's because they hadn't actually died yet. The body had stopped functioning, but they were still on this earth. So God says, ultimately, death is being separated uh, from this life. Well, to, to ultimately die the second death means to be separated from God for eternity. That's why you must Make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Jesus said, I'm the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. You must accept Jesus as your Lord. Otherwise, you will eventually experience the, the killing of the covenant. You'll experience the second death. Aren't you? How many born-again Christians do I have in here? Why don't you just give God a little praise right now for saving your soul? But not only does, does breaking a covenant with God kill you in the form of of uh, the, the second death. Also, breaking covenant just separates. It separates relationships. It separates you from joy. Separates you from peace. It separates you from trust. All the things that you need in order to enjoy a marriage and have a happy marriage, well, breaking covenant separates you from those things. All you really, everything you need to have a happy life. Breaking covenant separates you from those things. Matter of fact, uh, it even separates you from having a close relationship with God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Then the last part of the verse, it says, Treat her as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. When things aren't right in your marriage, things aren't going to be right in your relationship with God. 
When you start breaking covenant with your spouse, you're also messing up your covenant relationship with God. You need, you need to realize you're in covenant. Praise God. You're in covenant. Covenant breaking breaks communication off with God. Go back to Malachi. Remember, we already talked about this in verse 13. They're saying, God, why don't you listen to us? And God says, you flood the altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks on your favor, or no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. And you ask why. He says, it's because you've broken covenant with your wife. Everybody say covenant is important. Listen, covenant breaking doesn't just damage your relationship with that spouse, it damages your relationship with God. You need to deal with it. You need to stay in covenant. Everybody say stay in covenant. And the reason you have to do that is because your marriage is not bound by the authority of a judge. Your marriage is bound by the authority of Almighty God. We read there in Malachi 2 verse 14, because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made. God said, in verse 15, I made you one. The judge didn't make you one. Again, the preacher didn't make you one. He said, I made you one. So your marriage falls under my authority, not just the authority of the United States government. They can pass laws and say this is okay, but God says, unless I say it's okay, it's not okay. Hello. Listen, um, mm, just because society's okay with something doesn't mean God's okay with it. Society says try marriage for a while. If it doesn't work, we'll just divorce and try again. God says no. When you enter in, for those of you that are single that are considering entering into marriage, you make sure the person you're marrying is God's will. That you're prepared and you're ready because it's God and His authority that is sealing your marriage, not that of the uh, person in authority on earth that's presiding over it. Okay, Not that that's not important, but ultimately the real authority is God. And I'll just say this. If you have a problem with authority, you'll have problems in your marriage. I, I, anytime I meet somebody that can't submit to authority on the job, can't submit to authority in government, you know, the Bible specifically says submit to those who are in authority. Anybody that has a problem with authority, I almost always find out they have problems in their marriage because they're not willing to submit to the authority. Hello? Everybody say submit to authority. And then finally, if you're going to maintain your covenant, you've got to guard your emotions. Guard your emotions. Go back to Malachi again. After he says in verse 15, uh, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? Later in the verse, he says, so guard your heart. Guard, remember, the heart uh, is translated from a word that means the seat of the feelings, the center of your feelings. And so God says, guard your feelings. Guard your emotions. It's the center of the emotions. Guard your emotions. Guard your feelings because your feelings will tell you to quit your marriage. Your feelings will tell you it's over with, it's done, your marriage is dead, nobody cares, they don't care about you anymore, your spouse doesn't care about you, they're never going to change, then you know what, you're never going to be happy as long as you stay with that bozo. I mean, that's why his last marriage fell apart. You shouldn't have married him to begin with, so why don't you just divorce him and get out of that marriage? That's your emotions talking. God says, guard your heart. Don't let your emotions tell you to do something that God says not to do. Submit your emotions to the authority of God and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in this marriage. You say, well, Pastor, my marriage is dead. My marriage is dead. Well, here's the thing. When something is dead, you have one of two choices. You can either bury it or you can resurrect it. When something is dead, you have a choice to either bury it or resurrect it. Unfortunately, when people feel like their marriage is dead, they tend to bury it. But God says, I want to resurrect it. I mean, what did Jesus do when he came across dead people? He raised them from the dead. And when God comes into contact with a, with a dead marriage, you know what he wants to do? He doesn't want to bury it. He wants to raise it from the dead. Your marriage is not over. Your marriage is not hopeless. I serve a God who's more than able to help you to be able to have a great marriage. Praise the Lord. We hope this message encouraged you and increased your faith. If you're watching on social media, make sure you share any praise reports from the message with us by commenting and be sure to like it and share it with your friends and family. If you're part of our Life Church family and need to give online or you would just like to support our many ministries and outreaches, go to lifechurchfamily.com and click online giving. It's super easy. Don't forget, more messages as well as lots of information about Life Church are available on our website, lifechurchfamily.com.